Welcome to all of our attendees for the webinar on Implementation Science in Nutrition. I believe that we have more than 300 who have registered and we are truly spanning the globe for some of you early in the day and for others quite late. I am opening this webinar that is hosted by the Consortium for Universities in Global Health and I am the treasurer of CUGH which has over 180 institutional members as well as individual members. Just a few things I would like you to know about CUGH. We have an annual conference and in spring 2020, April 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C. with satellite sessions on April 17th. Registration, panel proposal and abstract submissions, both poster and oral, are open and can be found on the website www.cugh2020.org. And if you're interested in hosting a satellite session, that application is on the website as well. On November 19th, we are hosting a Hill Day in DC, the day before the ASTMH conference in the DC area. Registration is now open. CUJ is collaborating with our members to inform members of Congress, state legislatures, and the public about the value of global health to their community, state, nation, and the world. As part of this initiative, we are facilitating engagements between academia, their government relations representatives, congresspersons, and state legislators to assist elected officials in making informed decisions about global health issues and investments. Now for today's webinar. We have two speakers and I will be the moderator. My name is Peggy Bentley from the UNC Gillings School of Public Health, Department of Nutrition. I'm a nutritional anthropologist whose research is most centered on the first thousand days of life, beginning in pregnancy and through two years of age. I focus on research to improve maternal diet and health, as well as infant feeding, growth and development, and on qualitative informative research methods for developing and evaluating interventions. I am currently the president of the Society for Implementation Science in Nutrition, or CISN, which you will hear much more about from our speakers. I've been on the CUGH board for more than five years and am delighted that CUGH is hosting this webinar with CISN. Our first speaker is Dr. David Pelletier, a professor of nutrition policy in the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University. His research teaching and public engagement focuses on improved methods for the analysis design and implementation of nutrition policy and programs in low and middle income countries, and on scaling up nutrition interventions and the application of implementation science to nutrition. He is the past president of the Society for Implementation Science in Nutrition and was the founding president, which is just a little over three years old. Our second speaker is Dr. Isabel Michaud Letourneau, a nutritionist from Quebec, Canada, who has worked in clinical, community, public, and international nutrition for the last 20 years. She is passionate about international development and has undertaken diverse projects as a practitioner and a researcher in over 20 countries. Currently, she is the senior technical consultant with CISN for various initiatives that seek to apply principles of Im implementation science through directly engaging with country stakeholders. Briefly, in the next 40 minutes or so, you will hear from David and Isabel about CISN and its work to bring implementation science to the nutrition discipline. We know of many evidence-based strategies for improving nutrition and maternal and child health outcomes, yet many of these have not yet been scaled for impact. The framework and examples that David and Isabel will discuss provide a roadmap for how we can work with governments, NGOs, and others to realize the potential of improving nutrition and health for individuals and populations worldwide. David, I now turn it over to you. Thank you, Peggy. 
Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning into this. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's, it's really my privilege uh, to be one of the speakers on behalf of CISIN uh, to share with you our, our current thinking and some of our work in Kenya and Uganda, applying the principles of implementation science. Um, this is what I'll cover in my portion. Um, I'll give you a, a sense of the origins of CISIN. Uh, and the rationale for creating it and, and it, our vision and mission. Uh, but I'll spend most of the time uh, talking about the frameworks that we have developed uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to approach implementation science and improve implementation and some key concepts. I'll then uh, turn it over to Isabel, who will describe how we are operationalizing those, those concepts in Kenya and Uganda. Um, and I'll, in my portion, uh, I'll only take uh, 12 or 15 minutes. I'll go fairly quickly, partly because um, all of this has been um, very well elaborated in a recent paper that is open access uh, and that you can access from the link shown here. So a little bit about nutrition. Uh, we really uh, are seeing the opportunity of a lifetime uh, has arisen in the last 10 years. And one manifestation of that is the Scaling Up Nutrition Initiative, which has 60 countries engaged with high-level political commitment and seeking to, uh, to uh, ad address um, uh, malnutrition through a multi-sectoral approach. Um, so this really provides a wonderful opportunity for us, one that we've, we've wanted for a very long time. Um, the challenge, uh, one way of illustrating the challenge is with this graph from the Global Nutrition Report uh, which shows the, the number of countries that are on course to meeting certain global targets uh, with respect to key nutrition problems. And as you can see uh, with, the green, with the green bars, um, only about a third to a half of countries are on course, of those countries that have data, are on course for meeting the targets for still stunting among children under five, wasting uh, and overweight under five, and for exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. Uh, and virtually no countries, few or no countries, are on course for the anemia in women of reproductive age, adult overweight or obesity, or adult diabetes. So we have a long way to go in order to meet these global targets, and there's a clear role uh, for implementation science here. Another way, getting a bit more granular, another way to look at the challenge uh, is, is this graph in which each dot represents a country uh, and the bar graph represents the median across those countries for some key nutrition and nutrition related interventions. So the first bar represents early initiation of breastfeeding. You can see about the median is about 50 uh, uh, percent uh, and there's a wide scatter across that median. So here is uh, a, a, a strong evidence-based intervention along with the exclusive breastfeeding um, that has a long way to go in order for, to reach the kind of coverage that's necessary for achieving population impact. Uh, and we see variation across the other interventions in this slide uh, and variation uh, uh, across countries. And of course, if we had data within country, you would see similar scattering with uh, wide inequities or disparities across regions and districts within countries. And the reason for the challenge uh, is that we have these evidence-based interventions uh, we want to see an impact on nutritional status. We typically see in large scale programs that we are not achieving that nutritional status. Um, and uh, oftentimes we are uncertain as to why that is, which we call the black box of implementation. And one purpose of implementation science is to open that black box in each specific context, see where the bottlenecks are and address those bottlenecks. Um, an example of the kinds of factors that might be inside that black box, we can see with this uh, one uh, evidence-based intervention of micronutrient powders. Uh, here's a short list of some of the, the bottlenecks and complications uh, that occur within many countries uh, as, as they attempt to implement this seemingly simple intervention, which is a micronutrient powder that is sprinkled on the, 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 the food of, uh, of young children after the age of six months. Uh, in order to ensure their vitamin and mineral intake. Uh, and so this is, again, is a short list of the complications. And each of these requires attention in order to avoid delays and get on with population impact. 
So with that background, uh, because of those challenges and the opportunities, uh, CISN was formed in 2016 as, as an NGO. It is a professional and scientific member society to advance the theory and practice of implementation science and nutrition. And importantly, it mem its members include researchers, but not only researchers. The members also include implementers of many types, policymakers, and funders. And to date, our funding has come uh, generously from Sight and Life in Switzerland, the Eleanor Crook Foundation in the US, and then uh, funding for special projects, uh, such as the one you'll hear about from Isabel later today. <clears throat> so CISN's vision is a world where action They must be. Uh, they must be acknowledged. Uh, that must be met in order for um, for impact to occur. CISN's strategic goals are shown here: to advance the theory, methods, and conduct of implementation science, to strengthen the capacities at country level and strengthen the support in the form of, of, of funding and other supports for implementation science. Uh, goal three is to create an innovative and effective implementation science knowledge management system. <clears throat> and goal four is to focus on the membership and make sure it's inclusive of all stakeholder categories. And goal five is to make sure that we are well, well managed, well resourced and sustainable over time. So the rest of my talk, um, I want to uh, sort of tell a story of, of how we have defined the field for ourselves. And it's, it, it differs in some ways from the way uh, some others have defined implementation science. Uh, and I'll break it down into, into these five uh, uh, points, the five domains that affect implementation, the four phases or decision points, three categories of implementation knowledge, and then put it all together in an integrated framework, number four, and then I'll turn it over to Isabel with five strategies for operationalizing this framework. So these are the five domains whose characteristics, capacities, and dynamics and fit affect implementation quality. Um, this is, draws heavily from the uh, very well-known and heavily used framework by Dem Schroeder et al., with, which has primarily a US-based focus. And we've adapted it in various ways to fit the context of low and middle income countries and especially for nutrition. So the five domains are uh, number one, the objects of implementation, and they are quite different. And so the point of distinguishing these is that each of these objects places different demands on the system for implementing and implementing well. So we need to be clear on those demands, what kinds of requirements exist. Secondly, there are characteristics of the implementation organizations that can enable or inhibit good quality implementation. Third, and in like fashion, there are characteristics of the enabling environment um, that hopefully are enabling, but many times they are disabling or not, or not uh, helpful uh, to the goals of, um, of uh, population impact in a sustainable way. Fourth, there may be various characteristics of individuals, households, and communities, um, as shown here, that can be assets for good quality implementation or they could be weaknesses. Uh, so these need to be well understood in, in planning and implementing interventions. And the point of all of this is, is to get alignment among these characteristics so that there is good implementation outcomes and good nutritional status. And the triple A cycle in the top right is a reminder that this is a continuous process. We need to be continually identifying the bottlenecks in any of these domains analyzing what can be done about them, and then implementing those actions to remove the bottlenecks. So this is number one, the five domains. The four phases or decision points, it's important to recognize that the focus is not just the, the community level or field level implementation. Many of the factors that affect implementation quality arise much earlier in the process with the very initiation and scoping of the possibilities for acting on malnutrition, in the detailed planning and design, which can be done well or can be done poorly. Uh, and then, of course, there does have to be iterative improvement during the scaling up process. And there's, there needs to be consistent uh, attention to commitment, support, financing, and sustainability in the enabling environment. So each of these, 
uh, lends itself or can be addressed through a diverse forms of, of data collection and assessments, uh, hopefully that are very practical, very timely, and, and that generate the information needed in order to avoid or address the bottlenecks in each of these stages. Uh, and so again, I'm going quickly here, but these are just illustratives of the kinds of, of, uh, of methods that can be used at each of these stages in order to identify and address the relevant bottlenecks. And one point to make here is that the way we've defined implementation science is that there's a very big tent. There are many, many methods that can be used to, uh, to shed light on any of these uh, implementation bottlenecks. And so the, our, the field, in our view, is defined by the questions and the purposes rather than the methods themselves. And these, this is just a, a, a table showing that we've identified examples of um, uh, implementation research that fit various cells um, of this matrix. The other thing that CISN has done, and, and again, this, this is different from some ways in which it's been defined elsewhere, is we have explicitly acknowledged the importance of three categories of implementation knowledge. Let me start with this one. Uh, the first is contextual implementation research, and these are practical inquiries embedded in a context such as what we see here. And, and, and you'll recognize that many of these methods are familiar, familiar to us. We use them, uh, they're used all the time. Uh, they may not be thought of as tools for implementation research, but in fact, they are. And so this is to get a better understanding of the potential bottlenecks within a given context. Um, another category of implementation knowledge we call global knowledge and experience. And, and this is of the type that, that, for instance, WHO may have codified um, or other global organizations may have codified. It's the scientific information uh, demonstrating what works for implementation and how implementation can be, can be improved. And notably, it's not just published scientific work. It also refers to implementation experience in other countries, even if it has not been published uh, anywhere or in a scientific journal. Uh, and the third category is contextual knowledge and experience in the context. This is the knowledge and experience of actors in the country um, that, that this knowledge is used in everyday decision making. So people who are embedded in the context understand stakeholder relations, their histories and their dynamics. They understand capacity strengths and weaknesses in different sectors. They, they have a lot of experience about what has worked and has not worked and so on. And, and so this is a very important category that, that does influence the planning process and the implementation process, it's often not given the same credibility and importance as the other two categories of knowledge. And it's critical for adapting what is known from elsewhere so that it can work properly in a new context. So we see these three as, if you will, the three legs of a three-legged stool, that are, all of them are necessary, none of them is sufficient by itself for good quality implementation and planning. So now I'm going to sort of tell a story or build, put these pieces all together to, to uh, illustrate or describe the integrated framework that CISN has developed. So in the back of our mind is always the fact that there are these five domains and there may be bottlenecks existing in any of them and, 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 and they require attention. Um, there are three categories of knowledge that are potentially available and useful for addressing any of these bottlenecks. The goal is to collaboratively assess, build on strengths and address the weaknesses in the, any of the five domains in a timely manner during any and all phases of planning and implementation. And so the, these three categories of knowledge can contribute to that goal directly. But here's another important aspect of CISN's approach. We see these three categories of knowledge as also contributing importantly to the emerging science of implementation, the emerging body of knowledge, not just in one country, but globally, about how to do implementation well. So these three feed into that, that accumulating body of knowledge. Any science has to have an accumulating body of knowledge. And this is critical because this, the existing knowledge about implementation often has been codified and simplified into frameworks, tools, and guidelines that can improve implementation directly 
without the need for new empirical field research. And this is an important principle of, that Sisson has articulated, that we should try to address bottlenecks using existing implementation and management knowledge and principles first, and only resort to additional research if it's necessary. So this can, we, we feel that probably 75% or more of the bottlenecks in implementation could be could be addressed by more faithfully implementing what we already know. Uh, and then, of course, we should resort to various other forms of knowledge to address the things that, that uh, still, still uh, remain. So that's how we have put together these building blocks into the integrated framework. Uh, and the simplest way of thinking about it is that implementation science is, in, is equal to implementation research, the new empirical work that may be necessary, plus, importantly, KU, which is the use of existing knowledge about implementation. So that's the, that's the simplest way of thinking about the way we've constructed the field for ourselves. So uh, in terms of operationalize, operationalizing this in real context, well, we've uh, converted it into these five system level strategies um, that, that uh, must be uh, contemplated in a given co uh, context at country level. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Isabel, who will describe how these five strategies, in fact, are being used and deployed in Kenya and Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Hi, everyone. It's with great pleasure that I'm going to share with you about the Implementation Science Initiative in Kenya and Uganda. Um, this initiative is implemented by um, CISIN with 3IE, which is the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, thanks to a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Our partner in Uganda is URC, and in Kenya it's FHI 360, and in both countries we work closely with ministries of health. So for this presentation, I will briefly talk about implementation science principles, but most of the time I will spend illustrating the framework that D David just described and talking about the different strategies and how those are taking place in the, the two countries. So this is the last uh, uh, framework that David shared with you. And I'm going to really illustrate with examples and taking the, those different boxes and trying to um, show you what were some activities and steps that took place. But first of all, just uh, David end his presentation by talking about principles of implementation science. And so I just want to reemphasize that what is important for, for CISIN is really to collaboratively identify implementation bottlenecks. Um, and so the collaboration is very important and to mobilize existing knowledge, framework, and tools when it's possible, and then when it, it's not available or possible, then we, we do implementation research. And, and implementation research using various methodologies uh, which rigor, practicability, and, and timeliness as well. Um, and so to do implementation science, we need an implementation arena. And for this initiative, the iron folic acid supplementation has been selected. Um, it's an, it's um, uh, an intervention uh, that is important because we know that iron requirements in pregnancy are often not met alone by food intake. Um, also, when we have iron folic acid supplementation during pregnancy, it improves health for mothers, but also for the infants. It's a cost-effective intervention, and there is still a low prevalence of, of women, pregnant women, who take the minimum of 90 tablets. And, and so we can say that this intervention is relatively simple compared to other much more complex and comprehensive package of intervention. So we wanted to take a relatively simple um, intervention because what we were doing were um, already had a lot of levels. And so in brief, if I can just describe what, what easy the implementation science initiative is seeking is to address bottlenecks to improve IFAS through the use of existing knowledge first and then the generation of additional evidence to implementation research. Um, there are four objectives to this initiative. The first is to strengthen capacity for applying implementation science at the country level, so in this case in Kenya and Uganda. We also want to strengthen the interaction and knowledge exchange among key actors, and we describe them as like key actors within the national system. So you have people that work more in policy, program, and research by linking them. And with those two objectives, 
we also want to strengthen the implementation of IFAS programs in those countries. And finally, there is a, a bigger component and broader that is to increase the knowledge about how to apply and build capacity on implementation science. Now, what is important in, in those two countries, we needed the creation of a core team. And, and I can do the analogy with the blinded men, uh, blinded men and the elephant, if some of you, uh, of you know. So uh, a man who is blind, who touched the tail of the elephant, will say, well, an elephant is like a rope. Another one who is touching the side of the elephant will say, well, an elephant is like a wall. So it's really like this people have a good understanding of the part of this systems in which they work. But by having a core team that is diverse, um, it, it brings really the collective knowledge that we need to take to be able to, to do implementation science. Um, and so for this initiative, we have SISIN and TRIAE, so we're providing um, technical support. I, I'm, constantly in, in contact with the team in country. There, there is a national core team in each of those teams that always involves someone from Ministry of Health, NGOs, researchers. The composition is not the same, but it's very similar. And then there is the, the, the people who are more representative of the, the NGOs, the implementers. And so these are the core team in those countries, the key actors that touch on policy program and research. Then um, David was talking about those five strategies, and I'm going to illustrate each of those strategies by providing some examples. What I can say is those five strategies refer to different um, sources and type of knowledge uh, in the countries. The first one is called knowledge brokering, um, and some of you may be familiar with this, but, but knowledge brokers are people who are specifically tasked with accessing and adapting knowledge to meet the needs of different stakeholders, implementers, planners, and policymakers. And, and we can see a lot of um, literature on, on knowledge brokers. Oftentimes, those people are not called knowledge brokers, but, but it's a kind of function in, in the work that they do. And so I'm putting here some of the qualities and skills that really um, seems to be um, needed to be able to be a good knowledge broker. So respect, you need to have credibility, uh, you need to be accessible and responsive to, to people who need it, reliable, self-confidence. Then you have all those interpersonal skills. So, so we can see that really knowledge brokers are um, people people skills, they have people skills, but at the same time, they need to have a broad set of skills. And so what we know is also, that is um, kind of accepted in the literature is to find the knowledge broker is very difficult. And so for this initiative, what we have decided is to move towards a different strategy of having a knowledge brokering team, uh, because it's really difficult to identify one person who can have all those skills at the same time. There is a great paper, uh, if you're interested about this, in the literature from Gleg and Owens that recognize five role domains. You have information manager, uh, capacity builder, um, facilitator, evaluator, and linking agents. Uh, that are the five role domains. And, and so we are kind of uh, using this lens to look at the activities that we, we take. Uh, we use uh, a two-level knowledge brokering strategy that we can call because at the national level you have implementers, you have the team, and, and in each country there is a project manager, a project coordinator who is in charge of really um, doing this, this work, but at the same time this person may not have all the skills or the credibility, for example, for research, and so they just need to link to the, the appropriate person when it, when it is needed. And at the, the second level, it's more global and system, so I'm providing support to the team and when there is need to interact with someone with experience in a certain field, so I facilitate this kind of, of learning. In, in, in the knowledge brokering activity. Um, so for this strategy, we try to raise the awareness about knowledge brokering because oftentimes people play the role of knowledge brokers without really knowing it. So at the beginning, we had the workshop in Uganda with both teams in which we really talked about knowledge brokering um, and helped them to assess what kind of person they are in a group because we're talking of a team. So we use a tool that is called the Bill Bill Team, Bill Bill team Role. Um, some of you may know, but it helps to, uh, for you to know if you're an innovator, a coordinator, a monitor evaluator. There are different um, 
kind of behaviors that you can have in a group and, and by being more aware of the, the temptation or the normal uh, skills of different people in a group, then you can build on those trends and try to even increase um, the awareness about this. We also developed terms of reference and the team did this in terms of uh, better understanding the roles and responsibilities of different um, so this was for the knowledge brokering piece. A second strategy is the implementation tools. Um, there are various tools that can be uh, used. Um, and so what is important is when we're implementing a big program or even a small program, there are multiple barriers that are experienced and we need to have various tools to overcome them. And those tools can be diverse. Um, and so I'm providing an example in Uganda of two tools that were used. Um, the data tools is the district assessment tool for anemia. It was um, a tool developed by the Spring Project, if you are aware. And so the team use it at the district level and it's two questionnaires um, and they try just to collect as much of the data that were available to be able to have a better picture of anemia problem in the country. And then another tool that was used for the workshop was the program assessment guide that you can see on the right inside. The program assessment guide is, is a, a, a generic a tool that can be used for other different kind of programs, but it's basically done during a two day workshop in which you bring people working at different places in the national system, national level, district level, working for supplies, working on health services. And then you have them map out the system to better understand where are the bottlenecks, um, try to prioritize them and try to address them. It's very participatory and very insightful. And so those implementation, well, those tools were very important. And so it was one assessment done in both countries. But what is also important is you have this initial bottleneck assessment that is done, but you need to have also an approach that will help you to track and also document and identify additional bottlenecks. And so David was talking about the AAA cycle, so assessment, analysis, and action. So it's really an approach that you're taking by trying to use different tools and try to identify those bottlenecks. And, and oftentimes we refer them as bottlenecks within bottlenecks, which means that there are new, not new one, but there are many more bottlenecks that will come up when you're trying to have to address them. And so the third one is the global source of implementation knowledge and experience. And here we're referring to um, published area, published papers that are there, but also to experiential, experiential knowledge of partners there. Um, so we emphasize very much at the beginning that it's important to use existing knowledge and so I won't go much in details on this uh, but for example I, I provide assistance by carrying out a selected literature review on iron folic acid supplementation, on quality improvement approach, research design and those are all tools that we look at it and then uh, we try to um, develop some guidance now. The fourth one is um, the country-based implementation research uh, that David described a bit. So we could use different methodology to, to, to do this, uh, but once we have used existing knowledge, then we can try to formulate better what are some questions um, that we need to address in order to improve our own intervention. So I'll provide an example, uh, but it's important to to have these questions based on gaps that were identified, on priorities, and have also some potential solutions. And in Uganda, I'll just give you the example of, uh, they realized that from the bottleneck assessment they did, um, they were touching on three systems. One was the delivery systems, and they realized that there was um, um, uncoordinated health education, for the supply chain system, there was regular stock out that was a problem and the user system is more like the household level. There was a lack of male involvement in supporting women to seek wow. ANC services. And so for this, they decide to use their interventions, the quality improvement approach um, to improve iron folic acid supplementation. And, and if you're familiar with quality improvement, there is one approach that is called Plan, Do, Study, Act, the PDSA cycle. Um, and so PDSA cycle 
is what their intervention, but it's, a, it's also a tools that could be um, seen as, as the other tools that we were using. And what they're doing is they're trying to have a QI enhanced process for, for HIFAS. And so um, there is bi-monthly mentorship call, so, uh, question, for example. Um, and so, so with this uh, in, in mind, they will just go over this, two, this uh, PDSA cycle multiple times to try to develop some implementation improvements and address uh, the challenges. Uh, quickly, to give you just a glimpse of the, the design that they're using, they're using a, an effectiveness implementation hybrid design. It's a quite recent design, like it, it comes back to 2012, um, that has been articulated, but that is getting much more attention because what it does is that you have, for example, one study that is uh, doing a process evaluation of the implementation of an intervention. So you're really documenting this process, but at the same time, you're also, you want to evaluate the effectiveness of this, um, uh, this intervention because you want to make sure that you, you, you can have an effect on this. And so I won't go in details, but it's just really uh, illustrating those five different strategies that are taken place in those countries and, and are interlinked they are and feeding each other and so the final one is the implementation science network that is important because oftentimes people are implementing their program but they're not linked with others who may be doing something similar or experiencing uh, similarities and so we're trying to build an implementation science a network um, in terms of linking people who may be learning among each other and so the teams are currently looking and trying to see what is existing and find existing network in which they could maybe have a, a little twist of implementation science and, and be able to disseminate some of their lessons as well. And so those are the five strategies that we were using for operationalizing the systems framework and principles that David was um, referring to a little bit earlier. Um, the additional components, uh, a few talk, a few, uh, um, a few points on this is to be able to answer the objective four that is how to do implementation science in country and to build capacity, uh, we are doing, for example, a big documentation of this. So on a regular basis, I have Skype calls with the project coordinator in each country and with the team as well, where we do reflective practice. We are tape recording. I'm working with the research uh, specialist also to be able to code this uh, and, and be able to draw major insights on how to do implementation science in country. If you want to have a little bit more information of some of the things that we discussed today of the frameworks. I encourage you to look at the papers that David was also referring to. Um, you have a lot of reference about knowledge brokering, especially in this year, and we are ready to move on to questions. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's to you, Peggy. Thank you so much. Well, I really, really want to thank David and Isabel for these presentations and examples that have been so informative and the approach and innovations are far reaching, not just for nutrition, but for implementation science as a whole. Now, I would like to open it up to questions. It's your turn, attendees who are still with us. Please send your questions and I will direct them to one or both of our speakers. Please understand that we may not get to all the questions as we have many participants, but if we do not, please feel free to email any of us. So while we're waiting for some questions, let me just start. And David, I uh, want to ask you this, especially as president of CISN, uh, you showed there is a need for implementation science and nutrition as in many other areas of global health. But I'm wondering why a new society was formed just for nutrition when there are already several groups, networks, and organizations de dedicated to implementation science and health. Thank you, Peggy. I'd be happy to comment on that. So I think the first thing that, that should be said is, even though we've created a society for implementation science focused on nutrition, um, it, it actually is our intent to link with those who are applying implementation science in other problem domains and indeed to contribute to the evolving understanding of this relatively new field. So while we're focusing on nutrition, we see ourselves part of this broader community 
of interest in implementation science. But to answer the question, we felt the need to mobilize the nutrition community, both the implementers and the researchers, uh, towards implementation science, uh, because um, as, as the question indicates, uh, the field has been applied to other areas of health for many years, 10, 15, 20 years, but the nutrition community hasn't really engaged with it yet. We're kind of late to the game. And so as a matter of mobilizing our own community, we felt we needed to do something that would attract them. Uh, and secondly, arguably, nutrition has some distinct challenges. Um, we recognize that many health problems, global health problems, are multi-sectoral. But we think nutrition is somehow multi, multi, multi sectoral. <laughs> we, we have agriculture, we have social protection, we have WASH, uh, we have uh, different dynamics in the global food system and so on. Uh, and so we think we may have somewhat different challenges. We also have the double and triple burden. We have um, undernutrition leading to stunting, we have micronutrient malnutrition, and now we have non-communicable diseases with nutrition relationships. So for all of these reasons, we felt that, that we needed to, to, to create the society because these food and nutrition problems are gonna be with us for a long time to come, given that they take so many different forms. Thank you, David. Now, I have a, a question from uh, one of our participants listening in for Isabel, and that is, did the acceptability of IFAS come up as a bottleneck? Because I think we all perceive this as a big part of the problem. Um, thank you for the question. That's a very good question. In fact, yes, um, it, it has been um, raised as a challenge in, in, in some countries uh, in terms of the literature, like the palatability, there are the side effects as well. What is also interesting is some, some um, studies also have shown that um, some of the side effects are also being a motivation for the women who who could see that it's working so for example if if the stool become dark they, they're saying that, that this is just a symptoms and it will, it will just uh, it's working in this sense so so there is a lot of interesting uh, literature on this um, it's very cultural sensitive in the sense that uh, we need to look into uh, exactly the the context uh, if sometimes so they they may use the the pills like on a daily basis but there is now no, the the weekly intermittent so so by doing implementation science in in in, in this initiative as well um, this is one thing that we will investigate more in terms of what what is the challenges at the user levels it, but the problems that we were focusing on more is the the ANC services that I should say is women attend the services um, so late so often it's the second or third trimester so they don't even get the pill so so this is a major one that has been prioritized it doesn't mean that we won't go in details with all of those uh, but but it's a challenge to be able to address all of them uh, at once and so we're taking one one step at a time during this initiative okay great so um another question that's that's uh important I think is David if you could please explain again the difference between implementation science and implementation research. Sure I'd be happy to. Um, so we, there's a tendency we think especially for researchers even when they hear the word implementation science to think oh it's about doing some implementation research a, a new field project a new trial to test the effectiveness and so on and that's certainly a part of it. Um, but as I indicated in my talk, we view the field as a science in its own right. And a science has an established and, a, and an accumulating body of knowledge about something. And, and that something in this case is about how to achieve high quality implementation. So we think it's important that implementers draw upon what we already know. What are some of the first principles about good implementation and good management that should be put in place uh, and we can go a long way to improving delivery uh, and utilization of interventions if we simply do that. Um, and so we, it's important to think about implementation science as the existing body of knowledge that can be drawn upon immediately, plus new empirical work that sometimes is necessary to answer other questions that are still uncertain. Great, thank you. So. Um, Here's another one for Isabel. Um, 
this person can see that the PDSA cycles could be applied and evaluated in relation to bottlenecks in counseling and stockouts, but what kind of research could be done to assess and address the lack of male partner support at the household level? Um, this is a good question. And, and so I was in, in Uganda recently and, and we were looking exactly at the PDSA cycle as you, as you mentioned. Um, and so the PDSA cycle takes place in the health service delivery as, as you, um, you almost alluded in the sense that it's, um, it's used at this level. And so it's not used at the household level. And so there is a third study that I didn't show on, on the, the, the illustration of, of the implementation research uh, that is really going to investigate this. And so we're now articulating um, some kind of male involvements uh, that were uh, kind of explore was how maybe the male can, can, can attend the, the ANC services with the woman. And so, for example, if women comes with, uh, with their partner, then they may be seen faster. So this can have some um, um, side effect in the sense that it may not be uh, always ideal, but, but this is only to illustrate the kind of questions that are raised. And so the PDSA cycle is not used at the community level. Uh, it's other approach but the approach of of the doing the triple a cycles and, and trying to find the bottlenecks is is uh, is what is done to to investigate more at the, uh, the 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 user level we're thinking about doing focused ethnographic studies and so by talking with several pregnant women understanding more their barriers to attend anc and maybe the role that the, the men play could also provide some, some insight, but the PDSA cycle is not for the household level. So thank you for, for the questions and clarification. Okay, so um, another question um, is um, related to um, the IFS again, and one of our participants wanted to understand more about what some of the bottlenecks were, the real challenges that you had to overcome or are working on now in these two countries and whether there's any difference in the context of these two countries. Yes, so I, I will take this one. Um, I provide the main bottlenecks um, right now about the, the Uganda one. I can say, for example, in Kenya, they took a different approach. Uh, because because they realized that ANC, um, the women come so late to antenatal care, they decided that their whole initiative was going to focus on the community level. And so they are using what we call the Baby Friendly Community Initiative. That is a platform that is already taking place to promote, support, and, and protect breastfeeding at the community level. And so because BFCI is, is established in the country, it's already implemented not always ideally, they want to use this platform to try to strengthen IFAS, which means that the, the care group, like the mothers group that, that are created, they want to make sure that the, the, the messages for iron folic acid supplementation will be uh, delivered ideally. And so there will be a part on behavior change. So they have um, nine actions or seven actions that were um, decided uh, and contact point with key messages and they will focus on this part and, and so those are the bottlenecks now that we there will be exploring will be related to this platform and so we're building an inventory by, based on the particularity of, of the context of, of each country if i'm uh, if i can say so let me ask david this one i know you both work on this through a you project together and could you really talk a little bit more about the hybrid design? I, I wasn't too clear in, in listening to you um, what that really means. Okay, I, I can um, give you the, the short, simple answer and, and Isabel can elaborate. Um, it's basically um, uh, implementing, if you will, an effectiveness trial um, where the outcome is not iron status per se, but some implementation outcome like um, uh, like uh, frequency of ANC visit, utilization of the pills, and so on. And so there's an intervention group and a comparison group where we want to see if the PDSA cycle is going to improve 
the acceptability or the utilization or the delivery of IFAS. But at the same time, and this is what makes it a hybrid, we're not just looking at those outcomes, we're also looking at a, sort of a process evaluation embedded in it. So asking questions like, to what extent and how well is the PDSA cycle being applied in the clinics? How often are they doing it? Are they doing it well? Are they making changes based on what they're seeing and so on? And so you're, you're simultaneously uh, evaluating and improving the process of implementation of PDSA and ultimately looking to see if it imp improves certain implementation outcomes. Thanks, David. Um, I might direct this one to you again or, or to both of you, which is that based upon some of the innovations that have been developed by the framework uh, and in some other projects, could you talk a little bit more about what some of those innovations are with specific examples in addition to IFS? So um, I'm not sure I get what kind of innovations um, there, there are certain innovations in how we're defining the field of implementation science for nutrition, uh, but there's also innovations uh, in how to address some of the bottlenecks in IFAS. Uh, Peggy, can, is it clear from the question which of those the questioner has in mind? Yeah, I think that this would be something besides the work in IFAS based upon your experiences overall or in the literature. Uh, okay, um, I'm still not sure I, I have the question. So uh, are they looking for examples of how implementation science has been used in other contexts? Well, let's let's just go to another question. Okay. Can, I, can I mention one example that I, comes to mind just a second? Um, maybe for example, in, in this um, um, in this initiative, sometimes we see that women forget to take their pills. And so sometimes it's not that there is the side effects or that they don't want, it's just like taking uh, a supplements every day is a difficulty. And so one implementation innovation that has been seen in the field and is uh, in the literature is you can have an adherence partner, which means that there is one close person to the pregnant woman that, that is selected and this person is his role or a ro role is really to remind the pregnant one to say like hey, have you taken your pill today because sometimes like life women are very busy so this is an example of implementation innovation that came to mind that is in the literature that i would been discussing to see if we would try it for example um, uh, considering that this is a bottleneck that that was seen Thank you, Isabel. So this person, this next person is asking how the framework that's been developed um, really applies to using a systems approach to study um, the dynamics, I guess, let me see if I can read this word, dynamics of um, an adaptive system, uh, complex system with different methods. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I think one way to think about it, you know, the framework shows the five domains. Uh, and so that clearly uh, describes the whole system. But in practical terms, how can that be operationalized? I think the, the program assessment guide that was used in Uganda and Kenya, um, by its very nature, ends up revealing the issues and the bottlenecks in every level of the system because the participants in this workshop come from each level, from the community, the district, the, the clinic, the district, the region, and the national level. And people at those levels know their part of the system best, and they know what's working well and what's not working well. And so through the two-day workshop, they map out pretty well <laughs> um, the variety of bottlenecks in the whole system, and then they can be prioritized um, and addressed. Um, so that's how that's how the five domains in the system framework can be operationalized in very practical ways. Okay. Well, here's a question that I think um, is important. Um, she says, I am not a nutritionist, and I think my midwife colleagues and other community health workers need to be implementing your nutrition in initiatives, but don't have access to nutritionists. So wondering how to connect with some of your projects or any resources that might be important for us? 
Isabel, maybe you'd want to comment on that from the perspective of Uganda or Kenya and what's happening there. Yes. Um, so, I, for example, in, in Kenya, um, they have um, teams that are at the county level and they, ha they have nutritionists in their case. So that's um, not the same as the, this person, this question. But, but what they want to develop um, and, and also in Uganda is kind of collaboratives at those lower level um, and not because oftentimes the nutritionist may be working at the national level but you don't have and so by by building on those collaborative that will just link a few stakeholders playing different roles may may help access some of the maybe nutritionists at, at the national level or, or other nutritionists from other organization. I, um, I can say that I'm a nutritionist and we don't need to be nutritionists to be doing nutrition. And so there are a lot of sometimes community level key messages, like for example, like uh, breastfeeding and in this case, iron folic acid. Um, there are some some foods that are high in iron. So, so there is a lot of great materials from World Health Organization from UNICEF or from other organizations that try to simplify um, and have key messages that could be used at the community level, at the district level, without really having the, the whole big understanding. Uh, but, but if um, you have questions about uh, certain materials or things like that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think my um, our address will be available. I think after um, we will put on the slide, um, at least mind if you want to reach out to me and I'll be happy to um, to support that. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, this is to David. Community participation has been one of the biggest challenges. What can be the strategies to increase community participation in low and middle income countries? Um, well, uh, interestingly, one of the tools that we presented and Isabel elaborated on uh, is the AAA cycle, um, which is, you know, a basic, it's, it's a version of a basic problem solving methodology that UNICEF used quite well in the Iringa nutrition program in the 1980s in Iringa region, Tanzania. Um, and um, uh, community uh, health workers, village health workers, village leaders, uh, village health committees were all oriented and trained as to how to apply this triple A cycle to identify the problems in their local context. Um, and in the case of nutrition, this tool was accompanied by a, a, a framework for malnutrition, which uh, identified food security, um, health issues, and child, uh, infant and young child care issues that all might be problems for young child nutrition. And so community health workers were able to engage with mothers to assess the food, health, and care situation and attempt to take actions to address it. Meanwhile, the village was able to look for the village as a whole. What was the water and sanitation uh, situation? What was the food security situation during the, the rainy season? And so on, and tried to come up with solutions on their own, being supported, of course, by district level government and NGOs. So, so bringing in a problem solving tool like AAA uh, and, and working with the community to apply it is a great entry point for community participation. Thank you, David. Thank you, Isabel. Um, I need to close, but I want to thank our speakers, Karen Lamb and Dalal and the Secretariat for this webinar and the Q uh, Executive Director and all of you. This webinar will be archived in perpetuity on the CUGH website. It will be posted in two, three days. One of you asked the question, how to become a CISN member, go to the website. It, individual members, very low dues. That's also the same for CUGH. So I hope that you will all consider joining CUGH or CISN if you do not belong. The resources and tools there are quite amazing. And please do come to the annual conference of CUGH next April. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day or evening.